Cuba is in many ways not just a divided, but a schizophrenic society. It's divided between those who support the revolution and those who do not. Notwithstanding the hardships that are paramount throughout Cuba, they haven't forgotten how to smile and how to have a good time. The value system has produced an inordinately gifted, genteel, gracious, and generous people. They and those qualities are the real soul of Cuba. The island nation isn't easy to fathom. Um, it's enigmatic, it's ethereal. Attempts to view it through a US prism, US perspective, uh, often fall very short of the mark. We take our perspectives with us and we discover that Cuba surprises us in many, many ways and often very positively. While we as Americans, and I say that as a US citizen, English born, uh, often focus on the negatives of communism and the material impoverishment that is very prevalent throughout much of Cuba. Nonetheless, visitors to Cuba return home uh, emotionally moved and full of passions, having discovered so much that's positive, not least the community spirit that is uh, a quintessential part of the Cuban experience as expressed by almost every Cuban that you meet. That spirit, that real sense of what community means and the import it has for a people living in a communist nation is not something that's necessarily easy to understand by an American. But it's a very positive quality, whatever you feel about the human rights issue, whatever you feel about the material uh, difficulties that the Cuban people um, experience and live under. One of the reasons, by the way, that I love this slide here, this slide of my friend Julio Munoz, is that it demonstrates for me one of the key characters characteristics that I love about Cuba. The fact that the value system has produced an inordinately gifted, genteel, gracious, and generous people. They and those qualities for me are the real soul of Cuba. The first immediate impression that a visitor has to Cuba is that they've been transported back into a 1950s time war. It hits you immediately you land in the island. You walk out of the airport doors and there's an entire stream of 1950s and older American cars passing by. Doesn't matter where you are on the island. These high finned voluptuous dowagers from the heyday of Detroit are everywhere, rumbling often, rumbling down the street to the rhythm of the rumber on the radio. In fact, it's possible to find parts of Cuba where you rarely see a vehicle that is not a 1950s cacharro, as the Cubans like to call them. Then Cuba spun off into Soviet orbit, as we all know, casting a time warp spell over the island for, for the benefit of latter-day visitors, has preserved Cuba as the largest American automobile museum in the world. <laughs> the second immediate impression, again, it hits you instantaneously, is that you are indeed in a communist nation, made more surreal by its proximity to the United States. Billboards, as we find here, touting products and urging us to buy, 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 have been replaced by exhortations to revolutionary zeal. Fidel Castro is there, of course. Everywhere you go, you can't escape him. He's exhorting Cubans to fight on against US imperialism, not least in his ultimate proclamation that we see here, fatherland or death. Nonetheless, the most ubiquitous hero worship is of Che Guevara. You're all familiar with this character. Argentinian revolutionary, became Fidel Castro's foremost rebel commandante, and later helped steer, steer Cuba down the communist path. It's ironic, a tremendous irony to me, that as the revolutionary, Cuba's revolutionary minister of banking and finance, Che Guevara actually dreamed of doing away with money entirely. 
Yet nonetheless, these days, he finds himself as Cuba's most marketable commodity, <laughs> sold to tourists on everything from keychains to t-shirts. You can't get away from Che Guevara. He shows up in even the most <laughs> unlikely places. But this is a particularly fascinating time to be visiting Cuba. Fidel, in power for six decades, has passed the baton to his younger, but not sprightly, octogenarian brother, Raul. Uh, the two of them, very similar in many ways, but nonetheless, they're definitely cut from a different cloth. Raul is a pragmatist to Fidel's egoist and has initiated some may not seem to us like far-reaching reforms, but in terms of the Cuban experience during the last six decades, what I would consider far-reaching reforms that are intended to get the moribund state economy rolling. The biggest of those, by the way, which was initiated last November, is that for the first time since the revolution, Cubans are now able to buy and sell real estate. So we'll see where that goes. Um, but key to the plan, is to reallocate 1.5 million state workers and bureaucrats to the evolving private sector. So currently about 400,000 Cubans have been granted licenses to operate as cuentas propistas. These are self-employed people. Um, they operate under fairly rigid restrictions. You can't employ more than five people, for example. So don't expect to see the next Bill Gates or Steve Jobs evolving anytime soon, but they can now operate in 181 categories such as watch repairmen, auto mechanics or auto upholsterers like we see here, artisans often showing the most remarkable ingenuity and skill, or taxi drivers or others who rent out their classic cars, especially if it's a convertible for weddings, fiestas de quince and the like. The largest body of cuentas propistas actually operate private room rentals. These are for tourists, and they make up for the shortfall in hotel space in the state-run hotels. The state runs all the hotel properties in Cuba. Meanwhile, the private farmers and the private farmers' markets are alleviating the food shortages, which have been a serious issue throughout Cuba. Fidel likes to blame, always has liked to blame the US embargo for Cuba's obvious shortages for all its failings. Uh, notwithstanding that, it may surprise you to learn that Cuba imports 40% of all its agricultural imports from the USA, thanks to an exemption to the embargo that permits agricultural exports. Perhaps the biggest irony or hypocrisy, choose your, your word there, is that the grandma, this is the communist daily newspaper, is printed on newsprint from Arkansas. <laughs> the, the real problem for Cubans is that they're paid a virtual pittance in Cuban pesos. They average a salary of about $18 equivalent a month. But everything of any value that they wish to buy, that is sold in a second currency called pesos convertibles. It's kind of a hard currency. So, Life really revolves for Cubans around a mad scramble to get access to hard currency. Raul has even talked about doing away with the ration book. Uh, every Cuban is still allocated rations. They have a right to them. Um, and those who don't have access to hard currency, they rely on these rations. So it's going to be a hard time indeed for these people. Uh, who don't have access to hard currency, if it ever comes to pass, that the ration book is done away with. Thus, uh, Cuba is in many ways not just a divided, but a schizophrenic society. It's divided, obviously, between those who have access to hard currency and those who do not, and those who support the revolution and those who do not. And believe me, there are many people who do support the revolution, for sure. Pretty much every Cuban has to at least publicly, profess loyalty to the revolution. The consequences of not doing so can be severe, not least because every community in the country and certainly every block in cities is watched over by the Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, the Comité uh, por la Defensa de la Revolución, CDR. Um, and that means that many Cubans have learned to lead double lives. 
uh, not least, they have to publicly go along with uh, the Cuban government's constant anti-US proclamations. Here you see a statue of Jose Marti, the national hero, holding in his hands a little boy who looks remarkably like Elian Gonzalez. Remember the, the young child who was rescued from the sea? And there we see Jose Marti pointing an accusatory finger at what was the US embassy, now the US interest section, uh, because the whilst the Clinton government was certainly in favor of sending little Elian back to Cuba to his father, um, he has presented, or the government, the Clinton administration has presented in Cuba as wanting to keep little Elian. So there's this constant uh, presentation of the USA as the enemy. Uh, notwithstanding that, the good news is that almost every Cuban you will meet uh, demonstrates a deep affection for Americans and even for the USA. With all the hoopla about politics, it's easy to overlook the sheer beauty of Cuba, such as you see here, the Emerald Valleys and the dramatic formations of Vinales Valley. And then there are the talcum fine beaches dissolving into these bathtub warm waters, such as you find along a 300 mile extent of what is called the King's Garden. These are a series of keys on which the majority of the hotels in Cuba are found. And then you have the castles and the cathedrals and the convents evocative of the once mighty power of Spain. And yet again, the Yank tanks of yesteryear projecting yet another dimension of Twilight Zone time travel that echoes Cuba's even more antique mystique. Cuba at its colonial best is nowhere uh, better experienced than in the town of Trinidad. Founded in 1514 as one of Cuba's seven original cities, today it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's a lived-in city, pickled in aspic in many ways, with cobbled plazas and cowboys and pedestrian-only central zone. Old Havana has more than 3,000 buildings, of which 900 are considered of historical importance, including 144 from the 16th and 17th centuries. Nonetheless, the revolution has not been kind to Havana. The revolution turned out in the end to be an agrarian-based revolution pitted against the urban-based middle and upper classes. It warred against them. The revolution turned its back on Havana. So today, many of the 2.2 million people that live in Havana do so behind crumbling facades. The glamorous, once glamorous seductress of pre-revolutionary days uh, is now quite literally, as you see here, a shell of her former self. Uh, many people live behind buildings or within buildings that are literally collapsing around them. An average of 3.1 buildings collapse every day in Havana. The exception is Havana Vieja, old Havana. Uh, that is now in its third decade of a remarkable restoration project that was initiated in 1982 when Havana Vieja was named a UNESCO World Heritage City. A decade ago, Cuba had the second largest body of working steam trains in the world, second only to China. Uh, they're now being retired from hauling sugar as the cane fields are increasingly given over to food crops or live fallow. Sugar is imperative to understanding Cuba's history, Cuba's colonial past, and it's even its sense of identity uh, was tied to sugar. It's kind of, a, in a sense, you could call it the nation's bittersweet bondsman, and it's responsible for such curses as slavery, of course, but also the country's dependence, not only on a single crop, but on single imperial nations, first Spain, then the USA, and later the Soviet Union. Slavery did not end in Cuba until 1885, so no surprise that on the eve of the revolution, racial discrimination and prejudice uh, were a daily affair. One of the first acts of the Castro government was to try and eradicate that by outlawing institutionalized racism. Today, Cuba is one of the most intermixed societies of any society in the world. Fully two thirds of Cubans uh, count themselves as black or mulatto, which is a mixture of black 
and uh, are African and Spanish blood, though Cuban law says that, law L-O-R-E, says that uh, every single Cuban has at least a token amount of African blood in their veins. The, the revolution has also done remarkable things in terms of um, instilling a sense of self-assurance and confidence amongst Cubans um, and a lack of social pretension because it destroyed the racial and social stratifications that were inherited from Spanish colonial and then post-colonial uh, middle class and upper class structures. So those are gone because the middle and upper class were pretty much destroyed by the, by the revolution. So those, um, those Cubans who accept things as they are do so not least because uh, they trade off their sacrifices of what we understand as liberties uh, in exchange for a guarantee that everybody will have state-provided and free health care and education. Uh, that is a quote that comes up all the time when you meet Cubans. They're very proud of those accomplishments, uh, even though uh, it's not a 100% success story. Um, and you have to understand the importance of that. This is particularly true in the countryside, which was the great beneficiary in terms of health and education and even housing. Uh, there was incredible destitution in the countryside on the eve of the revolution. So notwithstanding the hardships that are paramount throughout Cuba, uh, they haven't forgotten how to smile and how to have a good time without resort to money. So in the countryside, the pleasures are pretty simple. That means cockfights, rodeos, dominoes, cigars, and cheap rum. The cities are obviously a little more urbane. That means movies and discos and dominoes and cigars and cheap rum. A few other quintessential Cuban pleasures. We can't get by without talking about baseball, of course. They produce some of the finest baseball players in the world. Chess may surprise you that, to know that every community in Cuba has a casa de hedres, a chess house. Ice cream, once is never enough. And then the Fiesta de Quince, the traditional 15-year-old girl's birthday celebration. And reading. Cubans with 100% literacy are fanatics for reading, notwithstanding the paucity of reading material and the severe prescriptions in terms of censorship. And uh, you can see here by some of the titles uh, who is the most popular author amongst them. So, but Cubans save their greatest passions and pleasure for music and dance. So music, the pulsing undercurrent of life in Cuba, is everywhere, from musica folklorica to more highbrow opera and ballet. By the way, Cuba has two world-class ballet corps. It's astounding. It still astounds me. 20 years of travel to Cuba, I'm still amazed at how many young people are accomplished classical musicians. Uh, we come across cellists and violinists and pianists serenading us as we eat at these restaurants. The government's sponsorship of the arts, which has been profound, uh, is perhaps best expressed in the Casas de las Trovas. These are traditional music houses. Uh, they're found in every single town and village nationwide. And the duty of the Casa de la Trova is to nurture the music of the provinces, to keep alive the traditions such as Son to Guanguanco. Just like the Casa de la Trova, every town in Cuba has at least one Las Vegas style cabaret. Outshining all the venues is Havana's Tropicana. This is still packing the crowds in has been doing so since it opened on New Year's Eve, 1939. Cubans love their cabarets. And any comment that, oh, these are sexist, will cause raised eyebrows and a shrug of the shoulders. Um, in fact, cabarets are very misunderstood uh, by outsiders. They're an integral part of Cuban culture. And the mulata, the, the mixed African-Spanish uh, Mulata is seen 
not just as a quintessential part of the cabaret, but also as a defining element of the national culture and the national identity. Moreover, in the cabarets, the uh, music and dance is primarily from the Afro-Cuban Santeria religion. Many of the songs are sung in the Yoruba language. And the figurantes, these are the major uh, mulatto figures uh, in the cabaret show, when they come out on stage in their sensuous costumes, they're seen literally as physical embodiments of the Orishas, the saints of the Santeria religion, such as Oshun, the provocative Santeria goddess of love. Santeria is the fusion of Catholicism with the religion of the West African uh, nations. Uh, this has been an integral part of Cuban culture for 300 years. Catholics who pray to the Christian saints may also at the same time make offerings to the Orishas, the uh, avatars, the African avatars of the Christian saints. Um, so many uh, practitioners of Catholicism are also practitioners of Santeria. And Santeria is the most important religion in Cuba. Even Fidel Castro is said to be a believer. And many a believer in Santeria believes in Fidel. The black and red flag of Fidel's July 26th movement were the colors of El Agua, the god of destiny. Fidel triumphed on January the 1st, 1959. January the 1st is the holiest day in the Santeria religion. It's the day on which the course of history is set for the year to come. And most importantly, on January the 8th, 1959, as we see here, when Fidel gave his televised victory speech, three white doves appeared out of nowhere and one landed on his shoulder as if like an act of providence. The white dove, of course, is a Christian symbol of the Holy Spirit, but in the Santeria religion is also a symbol of Obatala, the divine provider of peace. So you can understand the immense power that that moment had. To end, I look to one of my favorite anecdotes, and that was the night that I had my own, en own encounter with Santeria and Providence. It was the first date that I had with Mercedes, a Tropicana dancer who would become my girlfriend during five years. It also happened to be the last night of my tr time in Havana uh, during my three month motorcycle journey in 1996. And I had arranged to meet Mercedes after the show. So at uh, 1 a.m. I picked her up after the show and she turned up, amazed me. She had shaved her head, she was bald. She was dressed entirely in white. She was wearing a turban, uh, white clothes all the way down to her stockings and white high-heeled shoes. Uh, she was wearing these very colorful necklaces, collares, and uh, brass and copper banglets around her arms. I understood immediately what this meant. She'd just been initiated as a Santera, um, a believer, more than a believer in the center of religion. It's the next step, and the initiation uh, process includes animal sacrifice. So anyway, I didn't know quite what I was getting into, but I knew it was going to be interesting. Uh, and we, I didn't realize how interesting, we hailed this 1950s illegal taxi, a Ford, uh, and we were passing through the dark back streets of Havana, and a policeman jumped in front of the car, uh, stopped the car. And I could see out the window a man lying in a pool of blood. The policeman was stopping the taxi to commandeer it to take the man to the hospital. He had not seen Mercedes and I sitting in the back. Mercedes wound down the window, stuck her turbaned head out, and said to him in Spanish, um, you can't do that, I'm Santa Teresa. And the black policeman fingered, I remember him fingering his own collares, the necklaces, and waving the taxi on and the, the taxi driver hit the gas pedal, and I looked aghast behind me to see the policeman running off to find another car. I said to Mercedes, what on earth did you tell him? She said, I told him I was Santa Teresa, the patron saint of the dead. Had he put that man in the car, I might have killed him. <laughs> I felt a chill go down my spine <laughs> as I pondered what my last few hours in Cuba had in store in this island, improbable island, really of eccentricity, eroticism, and enigma. Thank you very much.